play one of those songs every morning when you wake up and, and look at the words and let them be your faith, your prayer, and your perspective. And you just can't go wrong. Yeah? That sure beats trying to get through the day and hoping God helps you. <laughs> Listen, the most powerful thing that will change your life that changed mine is understanding why we're Christians and why we're alive and why we wake up every day by mercy. Because if mercy wakes you up, there's a reason you're alive. Please don't get reduced to surviving. Please don't get reduced to just trying to make it or getting somebody to say something nice to you or fighting to feel better about yourself. The only way you'll feel better about yourself is understanding the gospel. If your identity came from him, you can only find it in him. If he's the reason we're here, then the reason we're here is in him. So life apart from him is a zero, and you'll never know who you are apart from him. I don't care how hard you try, it'll be a rat race your whole life. Even when you're doing seasons where you feel good about yourself, something will let you down because it's not locked in cement. And somebody could actually change that, and all of a sudden you get manipulated and deceived, and you become a product of things or people or stuff instead of a product of him and his finished work and who he is in us. I'm just telling you, I couldn't, I couldn't say it calm enough, passionate enough, soft enough, or loud enough. That little simple thing I just said right there, that's what has made me tick for 23 years. People esteem me, honor me, it's humbling, it's sometimes it's, it's a little funny feeling, but I get it. People's lives are being changed, I get it, it's awesome. But man, nobody has nothing unless he's given it. And what he's given me is a perspective that by faith I am going to live by every day. And hey, nobody or no thing that can change it. <laughs> I'm locked in, man. Like, you're just not going to break my heart. You're not going to frustrate me. You're not going to discourage me. Why? I did not wake up for me today. I woke up for his great name. He says in Ezekiel, my people, my people, they've dispersed all among the nations. My people went out into all the nations. Watch what he said. Don't get heavy on this. Watch. And they profaned my name everywhere they went. In other words, they totally misrepresented who I was. I'm going to draw them all back. I'm going to put a new heart in them, a new spirit in them, and I'm not going to do it for their sake. I'm going to do it for my great name. You're not a Christian for your well-being. That's why you're stressed out and full of anxiety and on 10 prayer lists. And your whole life is focused on what's wrong and your identity is revolving around the problem. And Jesus is here, and he lives in you. And you're a light, and you're called to shine in the face of it all. To have an amazing selfless attitude that gives him glory. Come hell or high water, he's the same. The reason you're here is the same. Nothing ever changes. Why should we? You're not here for a better day. You're here to look like him. If you wake up for people to treat you right, you're doing as good as you're getting treated. <laughs> and then you're wondering why they ain't treating you better and what's wrong with you and why do you always get stepped on? Now you're even more self-conscious, more insecure, more beat down. And you're living in an intellectual, psychologically driven world that's void of truth and all of a sudden there's no freedom. Even though you love God the best, you understand God and you believe he's your savior. You guys okay? Some of you look shocked. Like, I'm just preaching the gospel. We just sang the gospel. I knew David wrote that one song because it said, I laid down my rights. I knew that was your song. I said, he wrote that. And then Matt leaned over and said, David wrote that. I said, oh, I knew when I read the line. <laughs> when you become a Christian, you lay down your rights. Why? Because you deny yourself. It's amazing to me as a pastor how many rights Christians seem 
to think they have. Some of us think we get more rights now that we are a Christian, and even God owes us, and because I'm a Christian, this ought to, and this. And when you become a Christian, you deny yourself. You're not a Christian for your sake. You're a Christian for his great name. I promise you, this is the reason people come to church discouraged. They come to church discouraged Believing if they come to church and they get prayer, God will change what's discouraging them. Okay, so that changes, but then you're still positioned to be discouraged, so it'll be something else. Next thing you know, we're tricked into trying to live for perfect, convenient circumstances. And we're self-focused the whole time using all our faith to get things to work out for us. Are you with me? Yeah. Come on, there's no freedom in that. I don't see freedom in that. I don't see the church like freaked out with joy. <laughs> we let life speak louder than truth all the time. We let what we're going through define who we are and how we're doing instead of what he went through. I find me in him. Yeah. I'm excited to be alive. <laughs> Life's not a grind. Life's a gift. The only reason it's a grind because we're living it outside of why we're here so we're not finding grace to live. So we get forced into trying to make it. If we think our spouse has to change or our job needs to change or our kids need to change or our parents need to change to be okay, we're deceived. We're living in a form of idolatry. We're letting things matter more than what matters most. He's the Lord. He governs our life. He's the supreme being. He's the one that rules who we are. He puts a why in our life that nobody can take, a reason for being. To where your days of discouragement and frustration, they end because it's not ever again about you. It's about his great name and you're on the earth to shine and you understand that. Like I realized something really simple this morning. If there was anybody at the hotel in the breakfast area and you saw how long I was standing at the desk, it was just funny to me the mentality we're, we're branded by. Like they, they, they valeted my truck, so they had my truck since Wednesday. I didn't, my truck was sitting out on the curb. It had a tow sign on it, and, and I didn't even know that until I got out there and said, move this truck, it'll be towed. Well, they put it there. I don't even know what, what that was, but it was just funny because it was just confusion. And they couldn't find my key. Well, who knows? my key somewhere and even if they don't find it life's gonna move on we're gonna have to walk through it you can't let that stuff mess with you it's not about you and your truck and your and you guys and you got to be better stewards and you should have a better plan and you're telling me you don't know where my key is well you ought to take all the expense of this room off of power and love because I don't know how long I was standing there, but I don't know how to not be okay. And the poor lady, well, the longer time went, the more pressure she came under and the more nervous they got and the more they were calling and whispering and scrambling. I said, guys, it's okay, it'll work out. Somebody has an answer and knows where it is. Everything's, I'm just so sorry. It's okay. So we just chatted and I got to meet up with a few people and hug a few people and talk for a few people while they're looking for my key. It's a truck, it's a key, it's okay. If I'm that vulnerable and something like that cuts into my disposition and it's so about me that my day has been fractured, well then I'm a sitting duck for adversity. Satan will play me like a fiddle. And then because I'm so deceived and self-centered, I'll even wonder why God's letting it all happen. And if you really would open your heart and ears, he's saying, you're positioned for it. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow me. Don't just sing to me and pray to me when you're overwhelmed. Follow me. Let who I am in you start being who you are to others. Hello. I'm like
like this. Anytime you'll ever see me, I'm going to be like this. There's nothing nobody can do about it. It's, it's the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. Why? I understood something back when I got saved. My life's not my own. I am not a Christian for well-being. Please understand that I've realized over the years, many Christians become Christians for well-being. So in their Christian journey, they're puzzled why things aren't going better, and they let things not going better decide their disposition, so they live non-productive and get forced to trying to make it instead of shine. I hope you hear me. Are we okay, Pastor? I don't know what you came for today. I just get up, and this stuff floods my heart. It's not my fault. I blame it all on Jesus all the time. I just, it's your fault. I, you don't know what it's like when, when I'm in my shoes with a microphone standing in front of your faces. Like, I don't even have time to think about what I'm going to say. It just, just, it's just the way it is. Why? Because he loves us and he has a lot to say. And if he stood up here and you gave him a mic, what do you think his message would be? Hey, it's all right, guys. Don't worry. I'm taking care of it. No, I know your needs. Listen, trust it. I'm faithful. I'm going to get you a new job. There's just a little timing behind it. Try to calm down and find patience. <laughs> Listen, he's love. God is love. You know what's so powerful about love? You say that it loves us. No, what's so powerful about love, it doesn't seek its own. That's why it's love. That's what love is. Love is something that's motivated by not seeking its own. So if you're seeking your own, there's, it's never love. It's feeling, it's emotion, it's passion, it's empathy, it's sympathy. It could be ooey, gooey, starry-eyed, whatever. We call love a lot of things. What, what defines that it's love is when it doesn't seek its own. Why do we believe the people that are closest to us can hurt us the most when they're the ones we say we love? Because we don't understand love. They're the closest to us, so we have an expectation on them, and we have an, they have an identity. To, we need them. They're closest to us. They're, they can hurt us the most because we need them the most. They're the people we're relying on. But you say they're the people you love, and love takes no account. How much account? Guys, cheer up this morning. This is not my message. <laughs> Look, I'm just not interested in creating a, a yay atmosphere. And, and we, that would be easy because he's amazing. You could sing about him and freak out all day. But when you walk out that door, you got to walk into your sphere of influence. You come here, but you live there. And what are you going to do with the gospel? And is truth changing your life? And are you living with a single eye? Or are you vulnerable to the way that seemeth right to a man in former things? And getting reduced into trying to make it instead of you're already home. So this is a sharpening, training. This is a cheer on, stir up, and love and good works time. Yeah? Yeah, this is not what you can do for me. This is how you can make me more like you now that you live inside of me. How you can get my attitude to agree with yours. How you can override the old opinion of my life with the new truth of who you are in me. How you can fix my eye to look so it's so single that my whole body's flooded with light even when they can't find my key to my truck. It's so silly to me. You know, you stop for gas on the way here this way. This is just my morning. You just stop for gas on the way here. You're getting gas. Excuse me, sir. Hey, sir, I'm coming. I need a limping. I said, honey, don't fall. Don't hurry. I'm not in a hurry. I'll wait for you. I just need to talk to you. I'm sorry. I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to beg. You see what's coming. This lady's learned to live a certain way. Your heart breaks for her. You don't think, oh, man, I don't need this. I got to get over to Wake Church and preach the love of God. <laughs>
This is an awesome message this morning, buddy. This is just my morning. I don't know what your morning looked like, but they couldn't find my key. And they finally found it, and I pulled out. Now I got somebody tracking me down, asking me for money. Telling me they have a few habits, but they promise they won't use it for it because they need a prescription fulfilled. And can you give me a ride somewhere? I said, sure I can, honey. Jump in my car. I said, I want to talk to you anyway. <laughs> she's talking 100 mile an hour. She's, she's so used to scamming. She's so used to bringing up stories to get something, to try to play on people's pity or sympathy. She's been reduced to that. So she's reduced to survival. And she's playing people and she's learned and become so cold and callous to it because she's so driven by survival that she's saying whatever she can say to get something in her hand. And I just stopped her and told her how she's become used to living and told her that that's not my heart and she doesn't have to try to do that to me, that I love her and that I care for her. And here's my concern for you, honey. And she said, oh, I said, shh, listen. I was talking for three minutes and she's crying and says, I don't know why I can't stop crying. I said, because you've been needing to cry this way for a long time. You've this and you've ah. She's, she doesn't even know where to go. I'm driving. She can't get out. It's like when I sit on an airplane and they got that little glass window. I've never seen anybody get through there. But I've seen them almost try. Because I'm not playing. I'm in this thing. I'm not, I'm not bothered by it. She has no ability to get on my nerves. She has no ability to inconvenience me. I got new nerves. I am not alive for me. She doesn't know me nothing. She can't make me angry. There's no way I'll judge her. I will not see her according to the flesh. That's 2 Corinthians 5, by the way. I won't judge her with outward appearance. Because if you read a book by the cover, you'll never look into the inner chapters that might be very interesting and worth the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Roy, did Jesus die for that lady? Did he hang on the cross and see her set before him? Man, if I'm a Christian, I better see that too. You're not a Christian because you come to a wake church or whatever church you go to. You're a Christian because Christ is in you. Yeah. Don't you get in the habit of coming here and singing hallelujah and having animosity in your homes and thinking it's normal. No, that's not legalism. That's just straight talk. Don't think it's normal. It takes two to tango. It takes one to pursue peace. And if you're selfless, you'll never tango because you're a peacemaker. And you know what I read about peacemakers? Who's ever been blessed when they were tangoing? And I'm not talking about a dance. Who's ever honestly been blessed in the midst of a fight? You've been blessed in the midst of a fight? Animosity, tension. You know how spouses give each other the silent treatment, manipulate and control each other to express how they feel to get a message crawl. <laughs> Utter, total deception. Jesus would never live that way. He would, he would rather be marked guilty and hang on a cross and lay down his life than play that. To make the guilty go free rather than play that in hopes that the guilty would so see love that they'd become it because it's amazing. I read this in my Bible. Blessed are the peacemakers. Not blessed are the fight starters and the one that respond to the fight that started. It takes two to tango. See, I've been a pastor for years, so people come to me with stuff. They ask me, not so much anymore. I, they just listen to YouTube, I think. 
I don't do too many counseling appointments anymore, but when I full-time pastor, it was always people issues. It was he said, she said, well, I feel, well, how come? Well, that gets old after a while. Well, how long will I have to, Pastor Why? And I'm like, well, truth doesn't know time, first of all. So when you're telling me you can't take it anymore, I'm more concerned about your perspective than what they're doing. Three months into Jesus' ministry, if he said, I can't take it anymore, I'm tired of being blasphemed and bickered about and gossiped on, I'm really struggling with these people. I don't think I like them anymore. All I do is good, and they try to find what's wrong with me. What a bunch of goofy people. Can Jesus think and talk like that? Why? Why? Because he's Jesus? Because he's love. And he made you in his image. And he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And as he is, so are we in the world. None of us grew up in love. We grew up in self-centeredness. Our lives were driven because we were born into Adam. You must be born again. Please, Christian, don't turn that into a prayer that takes you to heaven. Being born again is a transformed life that puts heaven back into you. And makes all things new. And you put off the old man and his deeds. And you put on the new man, Colossians 3.10, renewed in knowledge according to the image of the very one who made you. So what's the cross? A restoration back to the image. The cross isn't a passport to heaven. We all say he's the way to heaven. He's the way back to the Father. He said that. We should know it. I'm not being mean, but self-centered tendency has even slipped into our preaching. And we tend to preach a gospel that benefits us instead of transforms us. That's why there's discouraged Christians when discouraged Christians are unscriptural. Pastor, that's unfair. You're being insensitive. You don't know what I'm going through and how hard it's been, and you don't know what they did. (laughs) If Jesus had your perspective, he'd be talking like that, but I never saw him talk like that. So if I never saw him talk like that, and he told me to follow him, and he made me for his image, I ought to probably get a hold of his perspective rather than believe what's destroying me. What would we accomplish if I stand up here and tell you every trial I had to face since I've been saved and everything everybody did wrong and the decisions my children made and the trouble my wife was in and the challenges of witchcraft coming against me and the pains that were in my body and the stuff that, I, what would it do to even talk about any of that and try to qualify and talk about the road of hell I've been through and then find out in the room everybody else's story to see who's been through the most hell? Well, brother, you don't know what I've been through. You're on a wrong road to begin with. Just thinking that way is a zero. What are you asking? Who's going to make up for what you've been through? Jesus didn't die on a cross to make up what you've been through. He died on a cross to get you out of darkness into light and give you brand new life with a brand new meaning, with a brand new identity, with a brand new purpose, and you never look back and you go forward. Why do you need prayer to make up for your daddy not loving you? When your father sent Jesus and said, love you! Look, my, I never heard my dad say, I love you. I just saw him drunk. What does that have anything to do with Christ crucified? It's a dry cup who needs truth. And if I'm trying to drink from a dry cup, of course I'm thirsty. And if I psychologically say, yeah, but that's my dad and I missed and he never and all my childhood. Ah! I'm 56 years old. What, 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 how weak is this? I'm 56. And I, yeah, but you don't know, Pastor. You don't understand what it was like when I was growing up. I'm 56! You hear the lie? The devil 
has tricked you into taking what was and making it your every day so tomorrow is always yesterday and you never have a present or things to come because you're stuck back there. You don't need prayer. You don't need deliverance. You don't even need counsel. It's time to believe that they didn't owe you a thing even though psychologically the world disagrees. Jesus gave you everything and you owe no man anything but to love. And in that transition, guess what happened? I had compassion for my dad. Not vengeance. The first day I got born again, I ran into my house thinking they'd be happy. Did you ever go expecting the motives of another? Did you ever get so excited that you wanted them to be as excited as you and when they weren't, it hindered your own excitement? Because you're so looking to get something from others. Well, you don't have to get excited with me. You're too late to keep me from being excited. Look, you guys could sit here like a bunch of stones this morning, not that you would, and just glare at me, and I'm the most blessed I can be, and I'm going to preach the same gospel, and I'm going to leave here excited. Because <laughs> I'm not going to let where somebody isn't decide where I am when they're not Lord. And I'm not going to let what they don't see decide my vision if he's the light of the world. I'm trying to get something out of my daddy. No wonder I'm thirsty. He needs help. And then I'm going to get bitter or I'm going to get deceived and let my identity crisis hit because I mustn't be worth anything. My dad couldn't even see the value of me. My own dad didn't even love me. He was hurting. He needed a savior. He was lost. Why are you assessing it in such a way that all of a sudden his lost becomes your lost? And then you have children and you're lost and you become to them what he was to you and the lie covers generations. And then we call it a generational curse. wonder if it's blindness and deception and no faith. Yeah. Hope you're okay. I'm passionate about that stuff because it's lies. I'm not mad at people. I see what it does to people and it destroys people that actually are good on the inside, that care about things. I am rarely talking to rooms of hypocrites. That lady that got in my truck, she's been so bitten by the world. She is in so much trouble. How could she be a pain to me? I got her to her place. I was praying for her. There's a lady. She's supposed to be getting. She said, I, that lady's waiting to take me. I said, okay, but I need to pray with you. I want you to pray with me. I took my time. I prayed longer than I normally do because things kept coming on my heart. I went to, by faith. Here's what I was doing, just so you know and understand where I was at. It wasn't the length of my words. It was my faith. I was releasing faith over her life, believing if I'd speak it over and into her, Holy Spirit would seed it into her and things would come to pass. So I might never see her again, Matt. I might never see that lady again. This was my chance. So I'm speaking life. I'm proclaiming. I'm prophesying. Ah, yeah, ah. yeah? Why? Because I'm a believer and I'm that serious and believe what I preach. When you believe, you respond. It's not when you believe, you quote doctrine. When you believe you attend church, when you believe you bear fruit, your faith, what you believe about yourself and what you believe is all revealed through how you live. The just shall live by faith. So she ain't showing no signs of nothing good, but Jesus showed me a sign that's good. Forgive her, Father. She doesn't know what she's doing. And I feel like, honestly, there's truth in my heart, and I got one crack at her. 
She didn't see me do it, but in the spirit, when she got in my truck, <laughs> I'm telling you, we cut into her. So her lady friend, whoever she was, was sitting there, and she's yelling. She got out of the car and said, look at it. And she screeched out and pulled out without her. She said, well, blankety blank you, holding me up. You know I need to get you blank and blank. And I'm like, whoa. Boom, up the street she went. I said, hey, you okay? She said, oh, I don't mind her. I, don't. I said, honey, remember what we said. You say, Dan, she's got a whole life of deception. You think one little time in the truck? No, I think Holy Spirit. Loves her and is amazing. And if I could sow a seed, something will grow. If you don't sow, nothing grows. Why are you praying for your city if you don't sow into your city? The kingdom of God is as if a man prays for his city. The kingdom of God is as if a man scatters seed. And then when you pray into that seed, God transforms city. Your city won't change because you're praying for it because you recognize it has trouble. Your city will change because you love the destiny of your city and the people that live there because, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. You don't pray for your city because it's overridden with drugs. You pray for your city because there's potential to be unlocked and destinies to be revealed and Christ to be glorified. So if you don't love your city and the people in your city, you can't even effectively pray for your city. You're just trouble-driven calling in intercession. Are we okay? You okay? You good? I'll keep looking to you because you're the pastor. So if I'm out of, out of order, you just pull me off. So I back out and I have to come here. So I'm coming up the road and I look up and the car that screeched out and the lady, they're sitting up along the road and there's two of them in the car and they're probably, should we go back and get her? Well, I don't know that blanket. Whatever they're doing, they're pulled along the road deciding, should I go back? So there's my opportunity. I fly up right up to their window. <laughs> hey, girls. I'm really, really sorry if I made that lady late, Ruth, late for you. I'm really sorry. Oh, no, no. Don't you feel like that, man? Don't you be upset about it. No, no. It's just a thing. I said, no, no, honey. Listen, I don't feel anything like that. I, f I feel great. I said, here's my concern. You're not doing well. And you're letting a little situation like that create such a hostility in you, honey. Your life is called to be so much more. And I want you to consider, and I gave her about 60 seconds of what I felt like God could take and impart to her. Because I don't have a ton of time. I just went, Phew! and I watched her sit up, stay super humble. And a smile came to her face and she said, sir, you are really a nice man. And I said, no, ma'am, I, I care for people. Jesus lives in me. He changed my life, and he's what makes me see how valuable you are to him. And what happened back there, listen. <sighs> okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, God bless you. I'm so glad I got to talk to you ladies. Have an awesome day. You say, well, that ain't going to, well, you sit in your unbelief all you want and fail to pull over your car and even sow a seed, have a religious opinion without even loving anybody. And I'm going to take my chances. <laughs> you just sit back with an attitude and an opinion. You just type out what you believe. Probably ought to shut that thing off and take a walk and look in somebody's eyes and be real. Probably ought to. <laughs> I can get away with that. I'm getting in my truck and leaving unless my tires are flat. <laughs> but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to believe Jesus fills them. Fill. Fill. You'll think I'm out there having a Holy Ghost service. My tires. Fill. Fill. <laughs> Whoever cut them be gone. I get saved. <laughs> Cut my tires, watch them fill up. You get saved. <laughs> uh, 
I'm sorry. Are you guys okay? Listen, this Sunday morning is like a pep rally to me. Sunday mornings are, it's not a lot of time. We don't have to, we're not marked spiritual because we stay all day or, we do, no. The reason we don't forsake assembling ourselves together is in order that we could stir one another in love. Love. It's Hebrews 10, it's there. Is it there? He's a Bible teacher. If you're from awake, you know he's a teacher. He's a good teacher. You gave me that little book last time I was here that you wrote. I'm not a real book reader. I think I told you that, but I said I'll check it out. But what I did was I laid it on the table. And my wife grabbed it because she reads books. And she said, who is this? This is good. And I said, I just wanted to tell you. My wife said, this is good. And she lives with me, so. <laughs> my wife lives with me. This little note, she put this little note in my Bible. I got these cards in my suitcase. I, I had them in my suitcase. She writes me those. She just sticks them in between my clothes. It's my wife, not a YouTube fan. It's my wife, not a YouTube fan. Not somebody that just sees me on a screen. Somebody that lives with me. You want to see the stuff she writes? Man, you want your family writing stuff like this. Hope you have the best weekend ever. You're a true man of God. Now, this is her talking because she's talking to me personally because she lives with me. She's not downing anybody of you, but I doubt God can find many men, if any, on this earth with your integrity, your character, and your heart. That's not a YouTube fan. That's my wife. Isn't that awesome? Why? Because she lives with me. And I don't fight her. And I don't have rights. When I go to the bathroom, I wipe the seat the whole way around. Every time. Every time. <laughs> Can you believe I said that in church? Hey, I'm a guy. I grew up with that thing. Don't pee on the seat. Make sure you lift that lid up. I grew up a guy. So when I got saved, it finally hit me. Hey, girls are suffering because of us. <laughs> this matters. I'm in a hotel years ago traveling with Todd. Todd says, dude, why do I always see you with a half piece of paper wiping around the toilet? <laughs> so I do it every time I go to the bathroom. He said, why? I said, yeah, I keep it clean. I messed it up. I clean it up. He said, what? So then Todd come to me later. He said, dude, you got me so convicted. I find myself wiping the seat all the time. <laughs> Look, wouldn't all the women just say a simple amen? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> it just, the gospel did things to me. Like, you know, I'm not, I don't take things for granted. I don't go in a hotel. Oh, they're charging me X amount a night. And then you just live it up, throw things everywhere and hog the place up figuring, hey, I had to pay for the room. I use one garbage can. I'm one guy. I don't make a lot of garbage. I don't put garbage in every can. I put it all in one so they just empty one. It's just simple stuff. I don't spread stuff around. I, don't, I, I think they didn't even have to do anything in my room. But one day I said, just cancel room service. I still laid money on the table. Because them ladies work so hard. It's not I give you, you give for me. It's not 50-50 business mind all the time. It's lay down your life. I love you and I'll prove it. Yeah. It speaks to people. They're like, why would you? Why would you? You, you want to mess somebody up really bad? If you can, if you have the means to do this, don't do this because, you know, you think, okay, I got to do this. Dan mentioned it. I got to do this, but it's going to really. No, no. If you have the means and you, you have the monies and, and I'm not even talking about sacrifice and doing it by faith. I'm just saying your bills are being paid and you're caring for your family and you're standing in the grocery line and your heart just goes out to that lady and you realize, man, I think she's a single mama. And she's got the two kids and you could tell she's not got a lot. She doesn't even have food stamps, but she's digging through. And you just reach up and swipe your card when her bill rings. Oh, it's the funnest thing. They go, sir, what did you, what? And the, the clerk's like, that was her stuff. Yeah, I know. No, I just paid for it. It's okay, honey. I wanted to. Why did you? Why would you pay for it? Jesus paid for my life. 
And it just came on my heart to pray for your groceries. And it's not me. I'm not paying for them. It came on my heart. Jesus paid for my life. I feel like he said, I want to bless her today. I want to show her that I'm thinking of her and that I care. And it's all covered by him. He loves you, honey. I hope you know him. <laughs> you, they never don't cry. <laughs> and the clerk's going, they leave and the clerk can't even hardly. And she's, that was the most beautiful thing. <laughs> And I'm thinking, isn't it amazing we got to live all these years and all this stuff, and when somebody does that, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Why isn't it just us? Why do people come to me and say, I never met anybody like you? Why do people in the church come to me and say, you know what I like about you? You're for real. And I'm like, well, what are you? <laughs> like, what is there? I guess half-hearted, half-thin, half-foul, lukewarm. We're all supposed to be real. I, I, I'm not excited that the greatest compliment I get is that I'm for real. So everybody that's complimenting me, what, that means they're all being moved by what's not real. Their hearts are getting jaded and I'm refreshing. You can live inconsistent in your heart the rest of your life and even do it towards me, I'm staying refreshed. Like, I'm never going to let that change what I see, guys. I mean, I'm going to have, five, I got a six hour something drive home today. That's awesome. It's me and Jesus in the car. But at some point I might stop, I might have to get gas. There, I might sit by a bit right in front of me. Hey, man, how you doing? You've been driving a long time? Oh, man, yeah. Where are you from? You just get talking. Next thing you know, you're right there. Shh, oh, fire. Oh. No. <laughs> you just get a little word. You just get a... Rather than, oh, man, this trip, six and a half hours. I wish I'd have just flew. Oh, I can't wait to get home. You pump a gas, and all of a sudden, you're the only one in the world. Going through an airport, you're more worried about if your flight's on time and you're going to make your connection. And why do we got to walk all the way to E from A to E? Why? You know, ah, travel. I can't stand travel. And you got people sitting all everywhere around you and you're missing the whole point because it's all about you and how the days unfold. I've been on oversold flights where I give my seat to people that can't make it because they can't handle it. They're falling apart because they never fly. And I fly all the time and I'm just okay. So why don't you just take my seat? I'm a frequent flyer. I have a lot of miles. I don't type in the seats on the computer. I don't expect first class treatment. I'll sit in the middle. It's exciting. <laughs> I know people that have status. And all of a sudden, you can't sit in the middle because you have status. <laughs> Pagans sit in the middle. See, my thinking in Jesus is somebody has to sit in the middle. Why can't it ever be you? When do you ever want to let life teach you that you've earned so much that you get special treatment? I know there's a lot of pastors and ministers who want to preach this stuff. It eats them up. They get probably mad at me because I've traveled with a few ministers that I'm a little conviction to their life. <laughs> they want treated a certain way. I was with the guy that gave a waitress a hard time because his order wasn't right. I am the wrong fellow to sit beside and do that if you aren't looking for change. <laughs> You're going to stand up in your gifting and anointed and people want you to pray for impartation and you're belittling a woman because the order wasn't right? I'm wondering if you know Jesus <laughs> or if you've studied about him. I'm just getting real. I'm just being real. You all right? Come on, because if this isn't our lives, what's the big deal? Then we're just doctrinally correct, and we're trying to talk people into a language they agree with, and then we won them? 
I think they know us by our fruits, not our doctrine. And if they can't see in your life what you say is so amazing, then why is it amazing and why would they want it? I know this. I don't want to go to church the next 30 years and never miss a Sunday, get thrown into crisis and respond like the man that's never been to church. Then I've missed something along the way. Is that, did we say enough on that? Yeah. Everybody says amen. Yes. <laughs> yes, brother. <laughs> I'm waiting till the last breath leaves and then we'll raise you all up. <laughs> Seriously, just, just simple. Christianity is all about dying so you can live. It's not all about dying. It's dying so you can live. So if you don't die to who you've been, you'll never truly live to who he is. There'll be a weird mix which is what we're so familiar with. We say, well, yeah, but everybody has their moments, brother. No, 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 stop. That's why you have yours. Because you believe they're coming, so when they come, there's no sense of repentance or conviction because it's the way we are, you know. So you never steward your heart or deal with your heart or take your heart before the Lord. I can show you in James 3.13, it says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by the good conduct of his life that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have envy or self-seeking in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth. In other words, don't appear to be what you haven't allowed the truth to cause you to become. If you have self-seeking in your heart, don't think it's okay and act like everything's okay. Deal with that. Take it before the Lord. Crucify it in prayer. Call it dead. Come out of agreement with it. Until the grace of God begins to shape you and mold you in a selfless way. So you can bear fruit unto God. Do you know how many Christians on the earth became Christians for themselves? For their own well-being? For the blessing? For the provision? For the protection? For the breakthrough? Ah, no wonder so many Christians aren't doing well. Because life will eat you up in that perspective. And you're only ever as good as it's going. I remember witchcraft coming to me and hitting me. And I was telling people, man, don't care about them witches coming to church. You ought to be excited they're in church. They were coming to church services. And everybody knew that's their witches. And I'm like, that's amazing. They're here, they're like, should we go downstairs and pray in tongues? Why? And show the devil you're freaked out by him and afraid? <laughs> so I'm the one telling them to not be afraid, and then this stuff starts trying to hit my body. What's it doing? It's coming for the word's sake. Okay, hotshot preacher, you think you got a revelation? You're all young in the Lord. Who are you to have a microphone? Who are you to be a leader in a church? You ain't even two years old. Who are you to be preaching in a church when you're nine months saved? Who are you to have a home group? You ain't even a year old in the Lord. We'll cut you down. We just know every man. It's all about themselves. Every man's for himself. You just listen to God in Job's conversation or Satan's conversation with God. Every man's for himself. Every man will do anything to save himself. That was the devil's Comment to God. That's what he thinks about you. So he's not impressed with your Christianity, your worship, your hands raised, your Bible devotion. He's impressed when you walk in love and love not your own life unto death. He's impressed when you look like Jesus. He's impressed when the anointing of the Spirit of God flows through your life because the pure in heart shall see God and he can't stop that train. He's not impressed with your confession. He's impressed with your mercy and your forgiveness. And your loving kindness. He's not impressed. He believes every man is for himself and every man will do anything to save himself. So witchcraft comes. I can't use my leg for days. It's a big, fat, swollen leg and I have zero use. It's like dragging a big hunk of rubber around for eight, ten days, whatever it was. I prayed for the sick. I preached 
two messages in the midst of that season. I saw about eight people healed of things that were prayed for over a hundred times and it had never changed. Why? Because of the component of humility and never letting my leg decide who I am or who God is, but always letting who God is decide who I am and decide my leg. Don't get it backwards. Hey, how you doing, brother? Oh, man, it's been tough. It's been a hard ride, but I'm hanging in there. How about keeping me in prayer? It's a dead giveaway that you're doing as good as it's going, and all your faith is wrapped around it going different, which means you're subject to your circumstances, so you're telling the devil, go ahead and mess with me. Are you guys good? Let's do this. We got communion set up, okay? This would be a great way to close this service. I'll tell you why. Communion is amazing. And it's not just the healing table, because it is. But almost all the time, we interpret everything we do for what we get out of him. What about blood for blood, body for body? What about covenant? What about your body for my body, your blood for mine? My life's not my own. Teach me to love not my own life unto death. I give myself to you. And as you lay down your life, I'm excited to lay down mine. As you shed your blood, I'm excited to give mine. Nobody owes me a thing because it was Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom and your love. It's still the forgiveness of sins. It's still the beating and bruising of his body and the chastisement for our peace. It's still all those truths. And you can grow in all those truths. But what about covenant? Isn't this the sign of covenant? Why do we get always tricked into God's end of the covenant towards us? And what we get from him now that he came. Here's the clearest definition of covenant that I know. At lunch, you can help me if you have a, a, a clearer one, because I would appreciate it. But this is the clearest one I know. All that is mine is yours, and all that is yours is mine. Two becoming one. I give myself to you. I went to a women's ministry. We received communion. It was a recovery program, and we did it like a wedding ceremony. And I spoke the promises of God over their life as they took the bread and the cup. And it was like they were getting married. They were, oh, it was off the hook, ridiculous. The Lord said, I want you to bring this into a place of giving themselves back to me. And it was the most life-giving thing because it broke every selfish tendency and reason to be dismayed. Are you with me? Yeah. So let's do this. There's a table here. There's a table there. There's a table back there. Can we just make our way as quickly as possible don't hug too many people even though you're in church. Just, just make your way. Grab the bread, grab the cup, and find your way back to your seats. Let's do this. Let's do this before the Lord and let it be a holy thing, a sincere thing. And you're the steward of your heart, so make sure you do this from the heart. Because you do yourself injustice when you do things shallow or on the surface, because you know you did it on the surface. That's why you don't see good things when you look in the mirror. Yeah, you need to learn to love yourself like he loves you. And do yourself justice. Amen? Amen. It's good to see you, buddy. <laughs> um, I have a question. So I, I haven't been baptized in a while right now. Um, so. Yeah, you just need to make it happen. Or do you come here? No, I came from Georgia. Okay. So yeah. Well, you, you just got to get, 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 do you have a pastor at home? Like a church? what I don't want you to think it has to don't have to be me. Okay?
We're going to do this with a motive that I feel like we're directed to this morning through the message. While they're getting their, uh, their elements, the communion elements, I want you to know that there was a season in my life where the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit asked me to receive communion every day. And he was, said he was going to teach me through the word I was reading the power of these elements. So for every day, I would take the bread and cup when I woke up. And I did it for a long time. And it got so big in me, the power of what he did through his body, the power of what he did through his blood, that it was probably 45 minutes in, and I still didn't even take the bread yet. Because I was just so growing in the accomplishment of his flesh. The way in 1 John 4, 1, that you discern if a spirit's not of the Lord is if he denies that Jesus came in the flesh. You think it would be if he denies that he's Lord. No, he denied that Jesus came in the flesh because the devil doesn't want you and I to know what he accomplished by coming in the flesh. And this is a great thing. When I did the Kingdom Living School, the Lord said, I want you to receive communion on every Monday, the beginning of the week. We did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for 13 weeks, three hours a day. They put the whole thing, it's all on YouTube. Every Monday, we received communion to start the week. And here's what the Lord told me. He said, Dan, my people are lacking intimacy with me. Not that they don't desire intimacy. They don't know where to go with it. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to be when they're alone with me. That's what he told me. A lot of that self-consciousness, not feeling good about yourself, feeling a little unworthy. Now you take 20 minutes to get past yourself to get to him. Bummer. He said, use the communion elements as a tool to trigger their hearts and to spring them into intimacy. And I went, oh my goodness. So that's how we talk communion in Kingdom Living School other than you know, other aspects of what the communion represents. But we used it as a springboard to intimacy. Picture this. You waking up in the morning in your home and you're just grabbing the elements off your counter and you just have them right there. And you just grab it and in your kitchen, Father, thank you for loving me. Do you know how many people aren't talking like that to God? Thank you that you value me. Lord Jesus, that you would give your life, your body, that you would hang on the cross when I was yet a sinner to forgive me and love me, to live inside of me. This is amazing. I thank you for loving me. And you could get real with God if this is where you've been. For years, I've been insecure. For years, I've needed people to say the right things. Those years are over. They're behind me. A new day's come, new life's come, the way's come. And I thank you, and the more you pray, you say, Dan, I can't pray that way, that sounds so fluent. I've been in fellowship with God for 23 years. Don't try to pray like I pray. I have fellowship and communion with God. So it's, I'm, I'm real at home with him. That makes some people mad. They think, well, that's not respectful. Are you kidding? I'm to come boldly into his presence. The more you do it, the more your heart builds language and understanding and the more grace creates knowing. All of a sudden, you know he loves you. Man, it's one thing to theologically believe he loves you because of the fact of the cross. It's another thing to let that truth through your relationship and communion get branded in your heart to where you know he loves you. I mean, know he loves you. We've come to know and believe the love he has for us. Yeah? yeah? To know you're valuable. To know you're indispensable. That the same price tag was on your head that's on any ever, anybody else's head. You're not higher. You're not lower. We're all in the same plane. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. He comes one blood, one sacrifice for all men. That's because we all have the same value to live for his image. It's not about your gifting and calling. It's about his image. It's about walking in the light. You don't find your identity through your gifting and calling. Let's stop making people heroes. No one has a thing unless it's been given. The things we can thank, thank you for your time spent with Jesus. Obviously, brother, I can tell you've spent a lot of time in the Word. Man, I appreciate the relationship you've cultivated with the Lord and how it's impacted your life. It's really impacted mine. I can receive that. I understand that. But if he didn't open this door, there'd be nothing to go through. And if he didn't have grace, I wouldn't be empowered. He started this thing. He'll finish this thing. Keep your eyes on him. Yeah? So take your communion elements if you have them. I better get mine.
Thank you, Jesus. I don't want to be cut off. No, I'm just kidding. Look, you could be sitting, you could be sitting woofing down a bowl of cereal. Don't get offended at me with this. Don't get religious on me. Don't, don't shift gears on me. You could just be, you could just be eating a bowl of cereal, woofing down, running late for work. And you're kind of hurrying, and all of a sudden you think of the cross and you think, man, I didn't even slow down. I didn't even have a heart to heart with the Father. I've been so busy. I woke up late. Oh my gosh, I've been just running. If I don't slow down, I'm going to just drive today. I'm probably going to walk into work and seem stressed. Oh my goodness. And you're there and you just pull the Cheerio right off the spoon and just snap the thing right there at the table. Because he said, as often as, he didn't say as often as Pastor Matt leads it, you take it. He said, as often as you do. I'll tell you, there's one thing. This is my personal pastoral opinion, Pastor Matt, that the biggest thing lacking in our lives isn't sincerity. It's personal spending time when nobody's looking intimacy with the Father. I think our hearts are right. I just don't think we let that right heart guide us to the right place. And we need to cultivate something with Him to where we know Him, where we're alone and we feel good being alone. And we feel good being with one another. Uh, we ain't afraid of the dark and we ain't afraid of being alone and if my spouse has to leave for three weeks what am I going to do what do you mean what am I going to do yeah you shut me in a room with no pictures no windows no tv no computer no phone you just shut the door put a little bedpan in there for me <laughs> and if you're only going to leave me in there three days you don't even have to put food or water just put me in the room shut the door with nothing better be ready when you open it because I ain't going to come staggering out there oh man I'm so glad you came to get me out of here I was I was bouncing off the walls maybe literally <laughs> why because he taught me how to be with him and to believe what he thinks about me through his son so it's not presumptuous I'm not running the risk of being presumptuous Everything that I believe he taught me through his son, through the cross. I love you, Dan. On your darkest day, I didn't lose sight of you. You have destiny, you have purpose, you have value. And I paid the price of my son for you to be my son. I've loved you from the beginning. You're only here because I said so, because life comes from me. There's a time to be born. Are you not here? You came from me. Call no man on earth your father. You have one father, and it's me. <laughs> That's pretty good. So you're woofing down the cereal and you break the Cheerio and you say, Father, thank you for loving me. Man, thank you, God, for grace in my life. Thank you for my job. I'm done complaining. I know people have been acting crazy, but I'm not going to let that make me crazy. You're not crazy. You're amazing. You're so sound. You're so stable. You're so amazing. Thank you that everything I see in you is what they'll see in me today. I don't dread my job. I love you. And it gives me a whole different view. I'm done complaining about my boss. I don't need you to knock him off his high horse. Forgive me for praying that last week. What I need to be is a better example to him. And I need to let him start seeing without me trying so hard. Just who you are in me because I have relationship with you. Holy Spirit, have your way in me today. I have this amazing sense that things are going to be good. Wonder if you would start doing that all the time when no one was looking and keep your eyes in that place. What do you think that would turn into? Yeah, don't be afraid you'll act and look like me. Just be the best you. Because the thing I just explained, it's what's wrong with me. Every time you see me, that right there is what's wrong with me. He's the God of the universe, but he's so intimate and personal that he's lived inside of me for 23 years. He's known my name and allowed me to know his. He's wrapped his arms around me. He's spoken to me in the quiet. He's spoken to me through his word. He has loved me through his son. And I'm ready to give it all back to him. Are you? Would you say yes? Would you say no to animosity in your homes? Would you say no matter how I feel like I've missed it on my job, I've only missed it if I fail to receive change and respond in truth. I've only missed it 
If I fail to pursue peace from now on in my home, I can't make up for the words I spoke a year ago, a month ago. But man, you can sure do a work in me now. And the words I speak can bring life, not pain. And in time, the one that I hurt with my words will see that you're doing a good thing. And hopefully they'll see that their life isn't the thing I spoke when they were so depending on me. God, would you bring change? Can we do that today? Can we believe for the redemption of all things and the restoration of all things? But first and foremost, we're given our lives. So when we receive communion, there's healing in this cup. There's a forgiveness of sins and by his stripes we're healed. Right? I get, I get all that. I don't want you to miss that if you want to grab a hold of that. Here's what I don't want you to miss this morning because of the tone that I'm in. You gave your body. I'm giving mine. You gave your blood. I'm giving mine. Can we pray? Can we do it together as a family? Are you ready? Yeah. If you do this insincere or you just do this because we're doing it, the Bible talks about that. It's not cool. You won't receive the fruit of the truth in your life. It'll actually dull your senses, sear your conscience, and won't produce good fruit. It's not that God goes, you did that insincere. Psst. You hurt yourself when you learn to live plastic because you know you're doing it. And when you look in the mirror, you can't see anything good. And the gospel wants to teach you to look in the mirror and see him. So when you violate your conscience, you shipwreck your faith and it's impossible to please him without it and to just live by it. Probably not a good idea to violate your conscience. Probably to treat it more important than your human heartbeat. Because if your conscience is seared, whether your heart's beating or not, you're living dead. So that's come alive in him. You ready? Father, we just thank you for the, the gospel. We thank you. I, I thank you. I'm honored here. I, I, feel, I feel honored right now. There's a sense of humility on me right now just that I could stand in front of you guys this morning and be here and cheer you on. The way you receive and the way you listen is humbling. So, Father, in expressing that, I just thank you that we're here as a family. <laughs> we're here as a family, and what you did for one, you did for all. And we acknowledge this morning that every one of us, whether we have different callings, different grace in our life for things in ministry, different passions, different visions, different talents, we're all the same in this one truth, that every one of us can wake up every day and live for your image and pursue love. So, Father, we hold up this bread representing the body of your son, Jesus, and we say, Jesus, thank you for giving your life and paying the price to remove our sin and make us right with the Father and seeing us through your own eyes and heart and vision as if we've never sinned and robing us in righteousness and writing our names in a book called life and giving us the garments of salvation. Man, let these never be theological phrases and positional phrases but let them be the realities of our everyday life. Consume us with the love you have for us. Consume us with the truth that comes through your son. We take this bread and we say it, it represents the body of Jesus given. And as we take it today, we're saying in our hearts, your body for our lives. We want to know truly, Holy Spirit, what it means to love not our own life unto death. Teach us in every situation and opportunity. We want to know what it means to not think for ourselves without being legalists and condemned. Would you teach us the very grace of life so that we can live as free as we see you, so that men see that freedom and see that you're good. Let our lives become desirable to the onlooker. Let our lives be desirable to the world. So as we take this bread, as best we understand, we're laying down our lives afresh. We're peacemakers. We walk in forgiveness. We show mercy, and we're asking you to help us every day. And if in any way we show something else, speak to us quickly, because it's not about failing. It's about becoming. And I won't get condemned. I will run to you and find grace 
and be in power. You pray from your heart if you're sincere and you tell the Lord, your body for my body, teach me how to walk in love. You pray that to him before you put that bread in your mouth from your own heart. And when you pray that and you're satisfied with your expression, you pop that in your mouth by faith to seal the deal. In Jesus' name. Mm. <laughs> Take the cup. We're done in a, just a couple minutes. Lord Jesus, you shed your blood. Your blood is amazing. It was holy, spotless blood. You were the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. You were raised from the dead by the spirit of holiness, according to the spirit of holiness, Romans 4. It's amazing. A holy lamb, holy blood, a holy God, an amazing unbreakable covenant through your blood. We enter into fellowship with this covenant, God, that you made through your son. And as we hold these cups that represent the blood of your son, we say blood for blood. We are laying down our lives. As you forgave us, we want to forgive others. As you made peace with us, we want to become peacemakers. As we drink this cup, we're saying we're all in, spirit, soul, and body. And we're asking your grace in our lives to father us and steward us into a life that looks like you. We thank you for it. Wow. Here's what I hear to just do when you take this cup. You tell the Lord if you're serious that you're saying goodbye today and ending the right to offense, discouragement, disappointment, or anything that rings a bell in your heart. All those things that have never produced life. You list them, you name them, you whisper them out, you say them in your heart. But before you take this cup, body for body, blood for blood, I'm all in. Go ahead right now. You tell God what you're surrendering and you tell the Lord that you're trusting his grace to make the difference, but your heart's willing and you're ready to run. And it's not about failing, it's about becoming. In Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Can you stand to your feet with me, please? Thanks for this morning. You, got, you want me to just close, Pastor, complete close? Or do you have anything? Or Okay. Here's what I want to say before I... I'm going to let Pastor pray over us. You'll do that? And he has a couple of remarks. Listen, thanks for coming. Thanks for letting me come. There's a lot of you. A lot of people want to say hey and stuff. Please don't just rush me for prayer and all that stuff. I'm one guy. There's hundreds of you. I'm not your answer. They have order teams. They have order ministries. If you need prayer, please go to them. Don't think, well, I want Dan to pray for me. Stop. Don't make an idol out of people's revelation or gifting or relationship. Be inspired by it to go become it. Okay? All weekend, the whole power and love, all week, the whole purpose was to empower everybody to run in the same thing that we see in Jesus. Amen? Okay. So just honor that. Learn to honor one another that way. And I appreciate your love. I don't mind that you guys are excited and want to say hi to me. I appreciate your testimonies. A lot of you have made me cry this week with some amazing testimonies of life change. People coming up saying, take a good look at me. My marriage wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for this revelation. And they'll cry and walk away. And I'm like, oh. Lift your hands with me, would you? Father, we thank you for your great unfailing love. We put our confidence in this fact that the way you love us today is the way you'll love us every day for the rest of our lives. You don't change. None of this will change. So thanks for the grace that we would never change except to grow up into you in more things, in everything that you are, the full measure of the stature of Christ. Father, I thank you for blessing your people with truth, with revelation, with grace and empowerment. And I thank you that today looks a little bit different and a little bit more like you than it would have if we wouldn't have come. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Love you guys. So good to see you.